afternoon. It's kind of that high noonish. So um, we just want to say that we're excited to have you guys here on the Native Wellness Institute um, Power Hour. And we have some exciting guests today. But be before we start, I want to first of all acknowledge the Noise Foundation for their support of the Native Wellness Institute. And I also want to acknowledge NICWA for their support. And their support is what helps to bring the Native Wellness Power Hours to all of you out there. So we're super excited today for this um, Power Hour. And um, I'm grateful and thankful to um, Shailene Joseph, who's behind the scenes, who makes the magic happen. And Jaleen, they've been working around the clock to bring all of you the Power Hour. Um, so this morning or this afternoon, um, I'm going to start off and um, we're going to start with a prayer. And um, so my mom and my sister are both here, Debbie and Jeannie, and they're going to start us off this morning. It's afternoon, but whatever. Ah, Custis Quistum, or good afternoon. Lim Limch, Kulin Suit, Namatkin, we thank you for this day. We thank you for all that you've provided us, especially for the sun, the moon, and the stars. And we ask you to bless all the birds that fly, for our mountains and our valleys, for all the animals that live within. We ask for blessings upon our Mother Earth, for all that she provides, for the roots, the medicinal plants, for the berries. And we ask a special blessing upon the most precious of all, the sitqua, the water, the giver of life to all things. We ask for blessings upon our rivers, our creeks, our streams, our lakes and the oceans, and for all the life that lives below. And a special prayer and thank you for our first food, for our fish, for the deer, for the roots and the huckleberries. For all these things, we are grateful as we ask you to bless each and every one that are here today. We ask you to bless us as Indian people, as native people, pitiful people, but with us and all of what we've asked, we make that chain of life, the circle of life that brings us all together. And so we ask for blessings on each and every one of our elders, of our families, especially for the mothers, the daughters, the sisters, for the Tupiaks, the Yaya, all of those that give life. We ask a blessing. And we ask that you put the good things into our minds and into our hearts. Give us a strong spirit that we might convey and do what we need to do at this time. For all mm. these things, Grandfather, we are grateful. Lim Lynch. Way, oh, way, ho, way, ho, way, oh, way, oh, way, hi, I, 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 Hey, hi, 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 hi,
Where'd sis go? <laughs> oh, there she is. <laughs> You're frozen. <laughs> oh, uh, can you guys hear me? Hey, that's <sighs> that fight. I know. My computer went out. <laughs> so all I can see is Jaylene. Um, <laughs> so, so, so today I'm going to go ahead because I know we're live. So today we're going to talk about uh, um, our pur purpose and what our purpose is and different battles in our lives that, that you know, we just wanted to take this time to share and um, my sister in their families. And I, I just really feel like it's important as women and as daughters and as mothers and as sisters that we take this time to share about you know to to talk about you know her journey children in a system that doesn't always want us in a system that that doesn't always support us in a system that puts up barriers because of the color of our skin. And Jaylene has always been a role model to me. She's, you know, one of my best sisters and I appreciate everything she's done for our people to, you know, blaze the trail of loving herself. And now over to you, Jaylene. Talk about Jaylene Finley. So, Levina, you're broken up. I can't hear you anymore. And so, can Debbie, she, no. I can't hear her. Can you hear her? She's froze. No? So, okay, I'll just, I'll, I'll jump in. I, I caught part of what she was saying about a system. And let me just kind of start uh, in thanking the, um, Native Wellness Institute for inviting me and thank you to Jeannie and Debbie and Levina. I mean, these are three women who I really admire and whose lives, um, you know, Deb and Jeannie used to play stick game with my mom and dad and I'd hear stories about them and their, their winnings. And, uh, and then Levina and I, we, you know, we were like two ships passing growing up, probably lying next to the stick game poles next to each other and didn't know it. I remember falling asleep many a time near my, my head near the stick game poles while my grandma, grandpa, mom, dad, everybody's playing stick game over at the Stampede and Spelum or up at uh, Hidden Beach and over in Welpinit. And so, you know, it was kind of like we grew up parallel to each other. And then uh, um, I had the misfortune uh, one time uh, going to speak and I followed Levina. Now Levina is tough to follow. I mean, she's a firecracker and so much energy. And, uh, and she's just amazing. I've just been so blessed to be a part of her life. And so then 
years later, uh, which will be part of my story, I our paths crossed again, and I ended up we ended up working together uh, for our tribe as youth community coordinator, coordinators in our various districts uh, with the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and uh, Healthy Nations Grant. And uh, there blossomed a sisterhood um, that has lasted for over 25 years. And I would say longer probably, and we didn't know it. Uh, let me back up a little bit. Uh, told you my name is Jaylene Finley. Uh, the name given to me by an elder is uh, and that name means uh, walking stick woman. It was given to me at a time after my brother passed and uh, I had stepped away from college in my last semester. Um, not not really sure about why I was there. Um, worried about losing myself and had gone back to my reservation, to my hometown, Inchilim, um, and uh, worked in the residential youth shelters and then worked, um, at, like I said, as youth community coordinator and uh, had given me that name at that time and uh, had told me that I was on a journey. And that is why I received the name Walking Stick Woman. And at the time in my young, younger mind there, I didn't really understand like really what kind of journey are we talking here? You know, I was still in a cloud of grief um, over losing my brother at such a young, such a young age. And Coincidentally, you know, I talked about uh, paths, uh, my path in friendship with Levina and her family is that we've had some parallel experiences happen. And, uh, you know, there was a loss she had experienced then too. And it had bonded us. And so this journey goes, I'm going to step back even further now. Um, I'm the eldest of six children of Dave and Bonnie Finley um, and grew up on the Kavala Indian Reservation in Inchilim my whole life. Very proud to be from Inchilim. No matter where I go, I always tell people Inchilim is my home. It will always be my home. Inchilim High School, I'm a proud hornet. Once a hornet, always a hornet. Um, and you know, and I kind of sometimes think I'm in this salmon's journey where I've left a river, small river, and being uh, a member of the Sinaiks Lake Lakes Band, uh, we we are people who've traveled along waterways for thousands of years. And so I liken this journey that I'm on to the salmon's journey where I began in a, a small community in a river and then ventured off to the ocean. And right now I'm still in the big ocean um, and, and I'm planning to journey back. Uh, and so that journey, the eldest of six kids um, growing up in Inchilim, very similar in ways to a lot of a lot how a lot of people grew up on the reservation when we were talking about today and what we were going to talk about one of the analogies that came up was uh what's this thread that ties Levina and Deb and I together and part of that thread is that at, at our core some of we have some very similar experiences um we may you know if you take a paper doll and you take their clothes off you know the clothes are just changeable but there's a core experience that's very similar the historical trauma that we were all uh you know a part of and uh in that 
you know, consecutive, the effects of it. Um, and uh, there, the hardships, the in our communities, all of the the ch the, the challenges that are endemic, the manifestations of trauma that we grew up around, um, very similar. Uh, being the eldest of six kids, I tell you a quick story. I was I was supposed to be a boy. Okay. My That's dad had made a so bet. Was Debbie. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> my dad <laughs> had made a bet that I was going to be a boy. He was so sure I was going to be a boy. And surprise. Um, so there he was with the girl. And um, you know, I think that I know my dad and my mom love me in in um and they love me, they love me the best they can, you know, in knowing their, their, their history and experiences, uh, they've had to overcome a lot. My dad uh, went to boarding school uh, when he was in, uh, he was taken to boarding school when he was a kindergartner, when he was five years old. And imagine what that would be like to be taken away from your parents and only being able to see them holidays, if you're lucky, you know, and, you know, and I could go into, uh, you know, the experiences of my, of my parents, but what I would just like to share is that theirs was really not, no different than a lot of folks, uh, the traumas that they had to experience in poverty and uh, loss of culture, disconnection, um, and so we're trying to parent what with all of that, not knowing that it was that they were carrying that, um, you know, from generation upon generation, but trying to do their best and having ho that hope like every parent has for their child is that their child will will uh, will be able to do better and be healthier and happier than they were. And that's the hope that I carried with me and I still carry with me through my whole life. Um, when I was growing up in Inchilim, <clears throat> uh, I was fortunate to be able to go to a school that was right in my community and that uh, the folks I grew up with went to the same school and we got to know each other, you know, K through 12 and you know, still connected and friends with, uh, there are still connections there. Many of my family, of course, right? And, uh, but the, the, the challenge of, even when you have a school right there in your reservation community at this time, at this time when I was growing up, was that there was still a very big disconnect between the school and the community and that may seem like how can that happen if it's the only school in your community how could the the school be so different than the community well that has historical roots as we know it has to do with a system and how a system is created to educate children and so if we look historically at the education of native children across our country that children were taken from their families and not allowed to go home that would disconnect the family was disconnected not invested not included in the education of their children um for many reasons because initially when uh schools were created uh like for example um they were often created where there were once army barracks and uh and they were ran by the military because they wanted to disconnect the child from their family to disconnect them from their culture. And so that began, those are the roots of the education system. Imagine that. And so then that over time it becomes uh, just kind of, nobody really thinks about that history, how disconnected um, children and family are from the education system. And so then the education system goes on for years and years 
and uh, students are learning about not allowed to speak our language, learning about languages and cultures and histories that are not their own, and walking into school, Levina, the part I did catch of what you said, is like walking to the door and being asked to stop being who you are. And that has been the experience for Native people for years and years. And it may look differently in different places. It may not seem like it sometimes to folks, but you're walking in and you're being expected to learn a whole nother culture, a whole nother worldview to for a time disconnect from yourself and to talk differently, to think differently, to learn different histories, different languages. And in the psyche of a person over time, you really start to disassociate, disconnect from yourself. It starts to create a space where you disconnect from your people. Um, uh, belief, beliefs can arise where you think that in order to be successful, to, in order to be able to make it, you have to deny or you have to uh, adopt or adapt to something that is not a part of you. So you start to feel like um, you're not a part of this, that somehow you're like an imposter, that you are trying to make it in that space. And having been somebody who's gone through this system, and it's not just where I grew up, it's, it's, it's everywhere. It's international. It's not just in this one little community, it's international. Anytime you're looking at a system that has not included people, that is, that is uh, created uh, from a very uh, cultural like uh, perspective, um, centric perspective, then uh, it will not include others' worldview. And so having gone through systems like that as a student and also taught in those systems, and now as an administrator, a school administrator in those systems, I can tell you that at every level, that is a mind, that is an unconscious, because I, I, I don't think that the people who work within a system are necessarily very conscious of it and how it manifests itself, but it is, it exists. And so where you can see that in data, you can see that in the disproportionate data and discipline, you can see that in disproportionate data of who graduates mm -hmm. and uh, test scores and how students perform. And so that has, going through systems like that, that has, that has not only affected me, but it's affected many. And so when I, um, when I was growing up, you know, being, being a part of my community and you look around and you're like, well, what, 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 what's here for me? What, what can I do? And all I look around and there are many people I love. The place I grew up in is so beautiful, but what, what can I do? What could I be a part of? And so, you know, I ended up moving away and going to college. Um, I shared with Levina in my bio, but there's, there's a lot more to it. Um, and I don't want to like kind of go into that, but I ended up going to uh, Gonzaga University and again, found that system. But being in that system at that age, I started to feel myself getting further and further distanced from my community, which is a source of strength for me. Um, um, there's also pain too. I mean, that exists at the same time. And, and yet that's where I, I felt myself getting further and further away, further and further from myself. And so then just before I was about to graduate, I stepped out, I stepped out of school because 
I wasn't sure, you know, is this my path? You know, is this my path that's going to take me further away from my people? And uh, so I went back and like I said, I worked for my tribe and uh, through the through the years of working for my tribe, I realized that in order for me to be able to create a path for others, I would have to go back to school. I'd have to go into that into the educational system, understand it, work within it, and to be able to make a difference. And so that is a big part of my purpose now as an administrator is to be able to go into systems and and change them and to be able to have an impact on them that makes them um, supportive of more students so that they can be successful and so that they have opportunities to be able to choose whatever path they want to go down. And so now uh, at this point in my life, um, I've uh, been reflecting a lot we were talking about this earlier amongst us, the ladies here, um, about 50 years old. And I think Theta was talking about this the other day. When you get about 50 years old, you start to reflect on your life and you start looking behind yourself and looking ahead of yourself and uh, wondering, okay, so now I have this much time left. So what am I going to do? And for me, it's very, still very, very important for every student, every person to be able to have options and choices that take them to a uh, viable, uh, viable life, whatever they want that to be, and to be, to be healthy and happy, not to feel like they don't have options. And so when you're in systems that are not supportive and don't understand you and, and, or don't even know how to help you, that's what I find a lot. Um, I want to be able to have an impact on those systems that create uh, pathways for more students to be able to make choices. They don't have to go to college because trust me, I, I don't think college is the only way. I think that there are trades, there are um, uh, apprenticeships, military. There are a lot of ways to go about finding your happiness and, and what you wanna do in life. And so I want those to be options for all students to be able to choose. Um, but what often gets in the way is that students are unable to get through that first system. And that first system is high school. And, and so that's where I've spent a lot of years is working within K-12 system as a, I started off in fifth grade, teaching fifth grade, all the way up through uh, early college and um, got to experience that from that going across those vertical levels and um, seeing what that looks like and how it manifests itself. So if anything, um, I, I think that when we talk about our purpose, strength, and, and our love, what led me to where I'm at is definitely the love for my people, the love for my home, um, in wanting people to be able to have options and realizing that uh, somebody is going to have to go out there and work on that um, and, and open doors and show up and change mindsets that, yes, you know, we can be at this table too. And we have brains and we're brilliant and we're smart and we're creative. And, um, you know, it's tough. It, it really is tough. I mean, uh, being in systems often that don't understand you and having to constantly educate people on uh, things they, that they, they've never been taught because they didn't have to be taught it. And, and so, but yet that is so important. And there are people who are appreciative of that, who want to know better and who want to do better, uh, but they just don't know. Um, and then uh, being able to change systems is, a lot of heavy lifting um, because they're they're well established, and uh, but I'm finding that as uh, I move along, that there are a lot of people who want to help with that, that want to partner with us in that, 
And so it's finding those partners and making, you know, finding those opportunities for change. So I, I don't know what my time is at, but I, I'm thinking that I probably have, you know, used up my time. So if you have any questions or if there's a follow-up question you have. Okay, thanks, Jay. And, and what you said is, is right on, you know, that, that we do have to really, you know, it starts in, in elementary and middle school and high school. And, you know, those are the, the first battles that we, we all face. And so I really appreciate your insight on, you know, why you chose to go that direction in your life and, and why you chose you know, to take on that battle. And it's just, you know, it's a really important battle that very few Native people go into education, you know, and, and that's one of the reasons why I started Rockin' the Res was because I wanted our kids to see our people in leadership roles. I wanted our kids to, you know, to, to in the summertime to not just see non-Indians as teachers, but to see people of color. And, and that's why I, I brought in, you know, Happy and Kimberly and Johnny and MC1 and, you know, all of these Native people to try to inspire our kids that we can do it. We can do anything, you know, and that was my heart. That was my purpose. And, you know, I, and I was inspired by my sister that, my sister was the one who fought all the battles in our high school. She sat the bench in basketball. She, you know, she was one of the best players in our school. And they sat her on the bench. And my mom and dad had to fight and fight. And, and even me, even though she fought all those battles in basketball to get on the team and stay on the team and get to play, I still got cut. I still couldn't play my senior year. You know, and it was, it was so hard and it was like, I felt like such a failure when I was, you know, trying my hardest to, to follow her footsteps and, and I couldn't, I, you know, when you get cut from the team, there's nothing you can do. You're just done, you know, but, but even though that happened, even though I got cut from the team and God, I can't believe I'm crying. It's been like, I <laughs> like 30 years since I graduated, <laughs> you know, but again, you know, I'm not the oldest, I'm not the oldest child. So I'm a baby. And I, and you know, that's what we talked about, you know, Jaylene and Debbie are the oldest children. So they're tough and they're the leaders and, and I'm the second child and I'm the big baby and I cry all the time and Debbie's over there flexing. And <laughs> so that's, that's why I wore this shirt. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I may not be the oldest, but I'm tough in other ways. <laughs> and so, you know, it's just, you know, that's what I mean. I, I, I struggled as, you know, going, going through school. And I think th because of our traumas, we all, we were all different. And for a lot of us, we, you know, because I wanted all the white kids to think that, I was just like them. So I got good grades. I didn't drink. I didn't smoke. Um, well, I chewed, but nobody knew that. <laughs> you know? I was straight up from the Colville Ranch. <laughs> you know, I mean, a lot of people probably don't even know that. I shouldn't even have said that. But, you know, but I mean, that was what I did. You know, I became an exchange student so that, you know, I was probably one of the first, maybe the second in the whole school to become an exchange student and go to Australia and live, you know, I mean, that was my, the best year of my life. And that was the one time in my life where nobody judged me for being native, for being, you know, Indian, like, you know, except that they only knew we were like cowboys and Indians, right? Like they were like, oh, no, no, no. you know, thinking that I still lived in a teepee and, you know, that I should have red skin and I had like brown skin and, you know, they thought I was going to scalp them, <laughs> you know, and I was like, I'm not Debbie Louie. 
<laughs> but, but you know what I mean? It's just like that that's what I mean, you know, to go to Australia and to be an exchange student and then to come back into the system that we live in and get cut from the team. You know, and I remember I I you know, I started going out. I started drinking. I started, you know, making bad choices because I failed. And you know, and I and I talk about this sometimes, you know, that that, you know, when my dad, when my dad quit drinking, he went up to the mountains and he asked the great spirit, help me be a better father. Help me be a better husband. And that day, my dad became a diabetic. His blood sugar was 700 and he should have been dead. But creator, 800, 900. It, it was, yeah, it was off the charts. And they told him, Deb, you can't drink no more. And that changed our lives forever the day that my dad quit drinking. And, and so when I got cut from the basketball team, and don't tell dad I drank, but I mean, <laughs> I, to this day, dad thinks I'm an angel. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you know, I did. I I I made some bad choices at that time, and and I remember I used to work in the morning and go to to school. Like I'd work at um, reservation attorneys with Veronica, or uh, Ronnie. And one day I was there with my Pepsi and my Hershey's candy bar. That was my breakfast every morning, and um and I was just sitting there and and Val came in Valerie Vargas Thomas and she comes in and she goes hey Pooh and because that was my nickname nobody knows that either but anyway that's my nickname stinker <laughs> Pooh stinker Pooh because <laughs> I I pooped all over Auntie Tina <laughs> when I was a baby and she stuck me with stinker Pooh and it stuck for life <laughs> And um, anyway, like this must be like, there must be some truth serum in me today. <laughs> but um, anyway, so, so I, I, um, I went and, and Val said, hey, Pooh, you should run for Miss Indian World. And I remember looking at her like, I just got cut from the basketball team. <laughs> like, how the hell could I be Miss Indian World? Right? And, but she just, I don't know, she believed in me when I didn't believe in myself. When I thought that I was a loser, Val believed in me and she gave me hope. And I remember that day after school, I, I drove up to North Star Mountain where Graham took us when we were kids, like he, she took us there all the time. And, and I went up to North star and, and I said a prayer and I asked the creator to cleanse my heart and my mind and my spirit. And to, to let me, you know, if I go run for Miss Indian world, let me do it with a good heart. And I, I talked to, you know, creator and I, I asked creator to help my dad because he was running for council and he wanted to stop clear cuts. And when I finished praying, I walked back across the creek. And as soon as I touched, it started to rain. And I could feel the creator cleansing me and telling me, I'm going to be okay. And I believe in you. And I trust you that you're going to do good for your people. And I got in my truck and I went home and I told mom and dad, I'm going to run for Miss Indian World. And I didn't even know what it was. But, you know, I knew what Miss Indian America was because me and Debbie wanted to be that. <laughs> but I, I had to figure it out. And, and mom helped me. And mom was my backbone. And so we prepared. And, you know, we drove to Albuquerque, New Mexico. Heck, back then, I hadn't even seen jingle dress dancing. Like, I remember watching, like, oh, what's that? And then, you know, all these, like, I mean, that was the biggest power I'd ever been to in my entire life. And... And so, you know, just going through that experience of, you know, running for that title. And I remember we were when we were driving down there and, and dad said, Pooh, he says, I don't want you to do this for yourself. 
And I was like, okay. And then he said, I don't want you to do this for our family. And then I was kind of like, well, why am I doing this? Why are we, why are we going? <laughs> and, and then dad, you know, in all seriousness, he said, he said, I want you to do this for the Colville tribe. And I said, oh, okay. I said, I said, and, and why is that dad? And he said, because we're in a seven, seven split. We can't make any decisions. Our tribal leaders are, you know, there it's over prayer and, you know, we need something good to happen for our people. You know, it gave me like, do this for the people. I'm like, all right, dad, I'm going to do this for the people. So we go down there and dad goes to bingo. Right? <laughs> like, he doesn't even show up like for anything, like the traditional <laughs> talent or, you know, my speech or nothing. It's just me and mom. And then, you know, so we do the whole shebang and we're in the pit and it's like, 40,000 people in the, the pit and mom and dad, well, dad showed up for that. Thank God. And um, so then we get in line and we're all like, you know, Oh my gosh, who do you think's going to win? And we all thought Claudia Adams was going to win. Cause she was like, you know how she's kind of like you guys, you know, just all proud all the time, you know, just walks around <laughs> like you got a chip on your shoulder. <laughs> That's how you and Debbie are. <laughs> anyway. So, so I thought she was going to win. I seriously did. So then they say, second runner up is Miss Claudia Adams from Popular Montana. And I was like, oh, snap. And I was like, she didn't even win. And so we're like, who do you think won? And, and mom and dad are sitting way up there. And dad's all, she didn't even win nothing. She didn't even place. And, you know, and, and mom's like, shut up, dad. And so we go and, and, and they're like, you know, the Miss Congeniality and all these other things. I didn't win none of them. Miss Talent, Miss Traditional, nothing. I didn't win nothing. And then they said, first turner up is Andrea Jones from British Columbia, Canada. And I was like, oh my gosh, she like made her own moccasins. And like, she was the bomb, like the most traditional person I ever knew, right? I don't know how to tan a hide. I don't know how to make moccasins. <laughs> and so so Audrey and Jones got first runner up and dad's all jeez she didn't it. You, he said a lot of cuss words but I won't say that but so he's like gosh she didn't win nothing and we drove all the way down here and lost all my money at bingo and I was just like oh my god so and I'm down there thinking well then the Hopi girl must have won because she had long black hair right I had curly hair it's like curly hair I'm not full-blooded hey, I'm not one of those full-bloods <laughs> so anyway so then Sammy Wyatt goes the second runner-up our first runner-up and it was Andrea Jones so then I'm trying to check out that Hopi girl down there and then he says the 1990 1991 Miss Indian World is a young lady from the Colville tribe and that was all oh my heard was the Colville tribe and, and that chick from Montana man she just picked me up and I mean that was like holy smokes and you know it was the coolest thing like you know like I couldn't believe it mom and dad jumped up and and um um Pete George was there and Lacey Abrahamson's dad Daryl Abrahamson Kevin and Uncle Donnie and, you know, they, they were like the five Colvilles in that whole place. And, you know, they were all right there with me. And, and I remember, you know, they crowned me and, and did all that stuff. But when I started the honor dance, um, this li these little girls, all these little girls just were looking at me. Like, and I could see my dream and Debbie's dream in their eyes. And it was like that dream that was so far away, like in the up in the universe, it just filled my whole heart. And it was probably the most amazing, amazing time in my life. And and I think what what I learned from that was that we can, you know, people can knock us down and they can kick us. And they can tell us that we're not worthy and they can tell us that we suck and they can, you know, they can shut the door in our faces. 
But if we believe in the creator, if we believe that the creator has our back, that our ancestors are standing behind us, then we can do anything. And that's what the creator proved to me that day was that I got you. If you, if you believe in me, I got you. And, and my whole, my whole life changed. And, you know, I became, you know, I just became like this, this, you know, I wanted to help kids believe in themselves. That's my purpose in life is to help kids believe in themselves and understand that they can be anything and they can be anyone. And the reason that I believe that is because I have sisters and in my life like you and Debbie and my mom and dad who went through hell and back, but they still are councilmen. They still serve their people. My dad became a tribal leader for 18 years, my mom for nine years even though they went to boarding school, even though they were molested, and even though all this shit happened to them, they still rose above it and became leaders of our people. And we are the children of those leaders. And we have to fight every day for our children so that they won't go down the wrong path. And we have to be the ones to lift them up and tell them it's gonna be okay and we're gonna be okay and we can do this, you know? And that's that's what life to me, that's my purpose, you know, is is to help uplift our people. And, um, and I am the middle child, you know, that's why I'm such a baby, you know? But I have to look up to my sister. Like if she was here, they were trying to figure out how to poke me and hit me through the screen, like, Get your crap together, Levina. <laughs> so, but um, I don't know. So that's that's my that's my purpose. I mean, you know, I, that's who I am, and I love you guys. And and so now I want to give my sister the chance to talk about who she is and. You know, what makes her a, a badass Marine and a badass mom and, you know, just all the, you know, whatever that she is. Um, that's not that bad of a word, right, sis? No. <laughs> Ooh, raw. Ooh, raw. <laughs> I know that. Semper Fi, baby. <laughs> all right, take it away, Sister Bell. Well, geez, how am I going to follow that, sis? <laughs> I love that. I love that story. But um, I just want to thank Native Wellness Center. This has been awesome. And um, I'm honored, you know, that I still have my mom and dad, you know, and I have my sisters here and, you know, with Native Wellness and all the work that they do. Um, but, you know, I'm just just happy and thankful and grateful to be here with um, my mom, you know, and her her prayers and, and like Levina said, you know, um, native wellness, you know, when, when I tell, when I talk, you know, a lot of it is just my, my personal opinion. So, you know, don't, um, but like Jolene said that, um, Theta mentioned, you know, there's something about that 50 year mark. Um, and, and Mm -hmm. I feel it now, now that I heard it, um, you know, so I feel like my first 50 years, 51 years, I was in a survival mode, Um, you know, um, and all of us, all of us Indian families or families in general, you know, that um, grow up in trauma, um, you know, and mine was starting out being born. My dad was a Vietnam veteran, 101st and 82nd Airborne. Um, I was born while he was in Vietnam. I was supposed to be a boy. so I didn't meet my dad right out, out the gate. You know, we ended up, um, I met him at, where did we move to? Fort Bragg. Fort Bragg. But I was potty trained and walking by nine months. Um, I was raised by Vietnam veterans. Um, we got home and, uh, you know, as a baby or a little girl, um, you know, I probably was molested 
by over 10 different individuals, some once, some several, several, several times um, up into a, a certain age. And um, I always attribute, um, and I don't, good or bad or how indifferent um, my path, you know, just struggling with alcoholic parents, um, being molested. I never said anything to anybody because it was mostly family members, um, people who my parents trusted, friends. Um, you know, I didn't stay overnight with certain friends, but every time I did, it happened. Um, so I just suppressed that my whole life, my whole 51 years. Um, and I, one day I must have been seven or eight, and I told my uncle Sam that I think he saved my life. Um, I went to Spokane to stay with my Aya, and I slept with my uncle Sam one night, and um, I went to touch him, and he stopped me. And so I, at that moment, I knew it was wrong. I knew that everything that had happened to me, those feelings, it was wrong. And I felt shame and guilt and, and fear in that time. And so from that moment on, I hated men. And I figured I wasn't gonna allow any man to, you know, have sex with me or um, take advantage of me. I hated them. And then on top of it, my dad being a Vietnam veteran and alcoholic and, you know, all the shit that I had to grow up with him. Um, you know, my dad never hurt me. I mean, he's one man that I trust with all my heart. And, but he grew up not having love or not knowing how to love, which, which many of our parents did. Both of my parents were molested. You know, um, both went to boarding schools. Both my mom was relocated to Chicago in the relocation era, but I didn't know any of this growing up. So I was in survival mode. I feel you know, like my ancestors, my mom, her mom, everybody, up until I became fifty-one. Because you know, in order to keep all of that down, um, I started. Um, I was very, I was a high achiever, but I had high expectations from our community. But at the same time, I started out being bulimic in high school. Then I was an anorexic in college. You know, at the whole time I had, I had put something else out there that didn't show me, didn't show Debbie in my pain. So it was like I was in a shell. And then, you know, I um, decided that I talked to some Marine recruiters and they said, you know, the Marines are the first to fight, first to die. We're the biggest, the baddest, the best. And I was like, oh, hell yeah, that's me. And there was 4,000 men to one woman at the one woman to the time I went into the Marines and enlisted. Um, I called my mom and dad and I said, hey, I'm going into the Marines. I leave in 10 days and my dad said, what the F, blah, blah, blah. The only Marines I ever seen were dead Marines. <laughs> um, of course that was in Vietnam, but I already signed and I left. So I went to boot camp, and then I got orders to go to Okinawa. And then the they had embassy guard school and there was only 12 women in the world who were embassy guards. and the Marines guard all the embassies throughout the world, but it's the hardest school. It was at Quantico, Virginia. Um, we trained at the FBI Academy. So I applied, I got accepted. So I flew back to Quantico and um, went, there was uh, probably 270 Marines. I was the only woman. And, you know, it was such a struggle at that time because I had men in my face telling me, you know, you shouldn't be here. You know, who the hell do you think you are? You're a goddamn woman. You know, the Marines aren't for women, this and that. But I always had to hold my head up, suck it up, do the run, seven mile runs. But it didn't matter where I was in the world. I had my eagle feather. 
And I remember one time we did a seven mile run and I got back to my room and I just cried and cried. And I would go back in my mind and I would think about growing up on the Colville Res and going hunting with my dad. And, and the, we had um, bread bags, you know, to cover our socks. And then we put our boots on to keep our feet from getting wet. But, you know, the snow was above my knees. And I remember I'd have to follow my dad's footprints and I had to keep up and I couldn't drop my gun, you know, and it was so hard, but that was my dad and he expected me to do that. So, you know, all those times fighting and fighting and fighting, you know, just to prove that I could do what a man could do, you know, I would, that's what I'd go to is my eagle feather and, and memories of, of my dad raising me um, in those times to get through that. And so I did, and I graduated, um, and I guarded the embassy in Barbados in Stuttgart. But even then, as a Marine, I was almost raped. And uh, this guy drove me off base. He was a Navy guy. I mean, mm -hmm. I was like, uh, captains and, and higher ranking officials always came on to me and, you know, but now that I'm older, I learned, you know, you have that fight, flight or freeze, you know, I froze, um, you know, but when I was almost raped, um, and that was in, um, youth in Virginia at my training school, all of my trauma came back and, uh, I wrote my mom a horrible letter, you know, then I realized I have, I have this one. I have little sisters at home. I have Levina and Dolly and um, other, cause up until that point I was filled with so much hate and anger and pain that I, I was so selfish because I didn't, I, I was just breathing and living it and trying to do the, that the, show the outside world that, you know, this is who I am when it really wasn't who I was. Um, and so, you know, I thought about, about my sisters and stuff. And then I got out of the Marines and I grabbed my little sister, Levina, Pooh, Stinker Pooh. We went to Haskell and we started our healing journey there. And that's where I met Wade. You know, I never trusted men up until that point, but we had a talking circle and Audrey Barnett was our unity leader. And, uh, you know, Wade shared that he had been raped. So I had a connection with a man, finally, that we we were best friends and we could start healing. You know, and from there, the story just goes into, you know, my career and, and my marriage. I've been married 25 years. Mm -hmm. But like I said, it was to cope with my last 25 years in my marriage and, and, and being a mother and, and how sacred that is and how a marriage should be sacred. That pain of all that trauma. I mean, I'll give you a, a quick story. Levina, she could have only been like six years. We were leaving Spokane and we had a hatchback and this is my dad. I mean, my dad was a scary guy and Levina had her fingers up there and I was sitting like where mom is and my dad slams the hatchback and starts driving off. And I look at my sister and tears, tears are just coming down and she's not saying anything and she's just crying. And I'm like, what's wrong with you? And, uh, and I looked up and he had slammed the hatchback on her hands. And I said, dad, dad, stop, you know, and thank God she didn't break any bones. You know, it, it was perfect with, with the lining, but that's, that's what we, we grew up with is, you know, just, I mean, how could a child be hurt so bad and be, but be so afraid to say that you just slammed the damn door in my hands. <laughs> but, um, I know where it's two o'clock. So, um, so basically, you know, raising my kids and, and, uh, all of this, even though I've had healing and I've been heal, heal over the years, it finally just kind of caught up to me and I replaced the bulimic, the anorexic with gambling. So, you know, 
I feel like trauma and it's a way to escape all these addictions, whether it be narcotics, alcoholism, gambling, um, you know, whatever addiction, um, because it, it just got to the point where, you know, I just, it was my only way to escape my pain. And so it got me to the point where I just <sighs> filled my head and I, I couldn't, um, I couldn't go on anymore. And this year in January, um, you know, I, I wrote a letter and I was going to end my life, you know, and, but I didn't have, I felt alone, ashamed, guilty. I've never been afraid in my whole entire life in this way. And I surrendered. I got help. I went to the psych ward and then I went to a treatment center and I started learning about PTSD, addictions, trauma, and, you know, and I'm, I'm still working on it every single day. I, I go to therapy. I'm doing this uh, therapy on EDMR or something like that. But, you know, you can heal on a daily basis. But when I say surrender, and like Levina said, you know, your higher power, whatever that is. I mean, it's something that I have to work at every day because my purpose now is I want to be a better human being. You know, I want to love. I mean, I still can't lay down with my husband when things, you know, how he touches me or if I smell things or, and I've been married 25 years, I raised my children. So I have to work through that because sometimes over the 25 years, I've hated Wade so bad, but it's not his fault. You know, it's, it's that deep thing because your body remembers but your mind pushes it down. So now I'm trying to, you know, get this out. And I know it's always going to be there. But this big thing, I want to make into a little thing. And, and, and I want her to know that it's okay. Mm -hmm. I want that baby to know that that was me <laughs> that you know it's you can do it you know i have to push through it every day i have bad days and i have good days and i have to ground myself and i have to pray and pray and pray and i have to push through it when these emotions come up because and i feel like my generation and my kids, you know, yeah, my mom, look at she everything she went through. And you know, they're they're successful and but they were in survival mode and they're strong, you know, but for me, I want I want this to go away. I want to know the why and I want to get to the core of it and I want to be a full human being. So I'm me and I can love freely. So part of mine is, you know, behavioral health, mental health. My purpose from now on is, you know, that we address um, these behaviors and we, these addictions and I can get a Idaho gambling hotline going and get some, some treatment centers for mental and behavioral health so that people can get a better understanding because i feel like it's our spiritual love when it comes to suicide because i've been there i know i mean you know i've been to that that dark place and it's like our spiritual love coming down from our ancestors and everything through what native wellness teaches on historical trauma some of our families most of our families at some point have been broke but it's 
keeping that higher power, surrendering to Colin Sutton, creator, you know, and and just saying, like Levina said with Miss Indian World, you know, give it to him. But it's words are so easy. Words are so easy. Um, and it's more, it's more for me the next 50 years, because my, my people on my mom's side live a long time. So for the next 50 years, you know, I'm going to be reborn and I want to work on, on that and, and, you know, helping and serving. And that comes with Jalene and Jaylene talk about connectivity, you know, and I was telling Jaylene, you have to be vulnerable to connect, which means you have to be able to trust. And my first 50 years, I was not vulnerable, you know, but in order to have connectiveness as human beings, because that's how our circle is, you have to be vulnerable. But our family histories and our family circles and our family cycles does not allow that vulnerability because of that historical trauma. So I'm trying to learn and trying to be vulnerable so that I can connect with you guys. And today's helped me. Um, you guys have helped me. And my time is up, <laughs> but um, I'm just honored and thankful. Did you have anything really quick, mom? Can mom say something really quick? Yeah, I am. Yeah, not I am. I no, no, that's good. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, I love you guys. I just want to say thank you for sharing. Um, this concludes our power hour. I know we probably went over time, but I love you and it's okay. And we're, you know, you guys are brave. I love you. Love you. Bye, everybody. Love you. Thanks, Shay. <laughs>